And so we're going to look at uh, Genesis 28. Everybody got your Bibles? Everybody? All right. All right. No, no lying tonight. Uh, okay. Um, Jacob left Beersheba. This is verse 10. Went towards Haran. And he came to a certain place. Remember that, that phrase, a certain place. And he stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of that place, he put it under his head and laid down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all of the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. It's a really interesting passage when you read this uh, this story is about Jacob, and it's at a place in his life where he's just not really uh, a hero at this place. He's at a place in his life where he's kind of, um, I mean, his, his very name we know is deceiver or usurper. He's somebody that is really um, not just a model of morality. He's, he's a pretty conniving guy, and he is just... Uh, basically tricked and manipulated his uh, way to get the birthright from his brother Esau. And he's plotted with his mother and he's now getting ready to leave everything that he loves, leave the land, really leave the area that he was inheriting and go quite a ways away because he is now in fear for his life that his brother is gonna kill them. Uh, we've all been there, right? Afraid for your life that your sibling is going to get you. Uh, look at this verse here, because he's really specific, really specific in verse 10, but then it gets really vague in verse 11. So Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. So can we agree? That's pretty specific. He's given us two locations there. But then it says, and he came to a certain place. So I'm going to tell you where he's coming from, and I'm going to tell you where he's going, but in the middle, I don't even know the name of the place. Well, I mean, it's just a certain place. Like, let's look at this map. There's a map that kind of shows where we're at here. Beersheba is way down towards the middle of the screen there, and about 450 miles, it's up to Haran. 450 miles that he's trying to get away from his brother to get towards some other family to help him out. And he is out in the middle of nowhere. This is just, just for reference, this is uh, just east of the Gaza Strip is Beersheba. And he's worked his way up right there where it would say Bethel. And that's where he's at at this time, just in a certain place. Why would the author be so specific about Beersheba and Haran, and then when it talks about where he actually is, be super vague. Like, what if I was just super vague and you're like, man, what are you gonna do uh, for dinner tonight? And I was like, oh, I'm just going to a certain place, bye. And just really vague about it. It's annoying, isn't it? But I think it's a, a part of the point of this story that God is gonna show up and he's gonna experience God in a pretty random place. And this says a lot about God too, because at this point in their uh, theology, different gods that belonged to different groups of people kind of had boundaries towards the land that those people occupied. 
And what's happening here is he's leaving the land that is occupied by the God of his father and his grandfather, and he's kind of come out into this new land, and what we're finding out is this God, Yahweh, is not like other gods. God, Yahweh, is found even where other gods aren't. He's, he's everywhere. He's even in the certain places. He's even in the random places. He's even in the places that, that aren't named. The places that, that we can't even really remember where it is because it just was so vague and so mundane and so out in the middle of, of nowhere. And that's the place where we just read that he has this experience with, with God. And God is not confined like all the other gods. We see something totally different with him. Now, like I said, Jacob, he's not really the model God-following kind of guy. He's pretty much a liar. He's, he's a deceiver. He's a, a conniver. But we also see that he's kind of experiencing the realities and the consequences of his decisions. Sometimes God will let you do that. Has anybody ever, does, like, you've really felt the reality of your decisions? Like you've made some bad, bad decisions and God's like, all right, I'm gonna let you live with that for a while. I'm gonna let you experience that. My cousin who uh, has gone through AA and NA and all the other A's he's gone through, he's uh, he used to tell me that, that desperation is a gift. And I think we do. We experience God in a different way when we're desperate. We experience God in a different way when we're at rock bottom. We experience God in a different way when there's no other options and we have exhausted everything that we can do. And that's where you really find Jacob. In this story, in verse 11, it shows us some detail. It says that the sun had set, so it's dark. And this is uh, Jacob who doesn't like to be outdoors. He's like we've read earlier in the story in Genesis that he's a man of tents. He wants to be inside. His brother's the outdoors, Bass Pro, Cabela's kind of guy. He's more like, let's go to the mall, you know, let's hang out. The sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and laid down in that place to sleep. That's, that's pretty rock bottom, right? Like he's taking a rock and he's going to use a rock as a pillow. It's dark outside and he's in the middle of nowhere. And that's where God shows up at the end of his rope when he's at rock bottom. When he's got no other options, God shows up. I don't know about you, but I think I've been there before when, when God showed up when you needed him absolutely the most. And he, he shows up to him and it, it wasn't at church. And it wasn't at a spiritual place doing a spiritual thing. He was just out there just doing normal things and God shows up to him in that moment and he doesn't just show up. God actually reaffirms something to him, a promise that he had given to his ancestors, to his grandfather. And God is faithful even when Jacob wasn't faithful. Do you realize that, that God is faithful to you even when you haven't been faithful to him? God loves you even when you haven't loved him. He sees you, he knows right where you're at. Even if you feel like you are far from him, he's not distant. The story is telling us that he's closer than we could ever imagine. He's closer than we could ever feel or think. And so he reaffirms this promise that he gives to Abraham earlier in the story. I just wanna read this too, because I think this is really important. He says, and he dreamed and behold, there was a ladder and this ladder wouldn't have been just like a, a step ladder. This ladder was probably something more like a staircase that was kind of folding together. 
this ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it and behold, the Lord, that word there, Yahweh, so he's, he's anchoring this promise that he's going to make to, to Jacob and his very character and his personal name. He's anchoring it in who he is. I am the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Amen? And then here's an amazing part of it. This is like the promise that we all need to like get a hold of tonight. Behold, I am with you. I'm with you. He's not distant. He's not far off. He's right here with us. Now, this is amazing too, because in a couple chapters, you see this promise played out in the present in the future in a testimony of the past. And this is what I mean. If you look at this next verse, This next verse says this, Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred, and I will be with you. Now, he just said he is with them, which is a now promise. He's not saying like, man, if you do good, if you clean yourself up, if you stop lying to your brother and cheating, then I'll be with you. He's just said before, I am with you. And now, a couple chapters later, he said, I will be with you. And then a couple verses later, he says, but the God of my fathers has been with me. So he's past, present, and future. There is a God who is with you. You might not always feel it. You might not always know it. You might not always understand it or see it, but the, there is a God who is with you. He is here. He is here. Verse 16 and 17 are verses that I think I've loved my whole life. Like ever since I've heard these verses, I just want to read those. And then Jacob awoke from his sleep and he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. The whole time God was there. The whole time. Like Do you realize there's not one day or one moment in your life that God has not been right there with you? You have never for a second come outside of the umbrella of his grace, of his care, of his his knowledge, of his sovereignty. You've never come out even one second where he didn't know where you were, what you were going through, what you were thinking, what your heart desired. There's not one moment that has happened where he's been far from you. And he says this, he goes on, and he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? I love that, right? Do you guys remember the song we used to sing, like, you are awesome in this place? Mighty God. Let's go, right? Let's go. (laughs) How awesome. This is just the same place where a few verses ago, he's in the dark with a rock for a pillow running from his brother outside where he doesn't want to be in just a random place. And now this place is awesome. Do you realize what it does for the human heart when we change our perspective to a God perspective of that he's with us, that he's here? That changes everything, doesn't it? It changes the situation that you're in from a a hard situation that is hopeless, that is full of darkness, that is full of doubt, that is full of struggle, that is full of pain, to this place is awesome. The presence of God can do that. It can turn everything around in just a moment. It can turn everything around. The presence of God is amazing. It is awesome. And that's what he's saying. He's he's saying it with like an exclamation. He's like, this place is awesome. And just know this, like, like the presence of God is here. It's here. It's It's everywhere. It's not just at church on Sundays or on Wednesdays. It's not just on Auburn Street presence of God is at your home. 
The presence of God is at those certain places that you work at, those certain places where you hang out, those certain places where you take your kid to play soccer with 30,000 other kids on Saturday. The presence of God is there. It's about changing perspective. Now, I love to see in Scripture places that are unique and places that are specific and places that stand out. This is not one of them. This is something that is, is a thread that goes all the way through Scripture that God is closer than we think. Like it's something that's happening all the time that, that God is there and then humanity is the one that's not realizing that it's there. Like think of this verse uh, in Exodus 31. It says this, and this is the story of Moses, right? Moses for 40 years has been walking out in the desert for 40 years. He knows this area really good. He's been uh, tending sheep for his father-in-law, Jethro. And it says this, now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of uh, Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. Can you imagine this moment? The voice of God calling out of this burning bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off, your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. You guys remember the song we used to sing, holy ground, right? And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. That's amazing that he comes upon this place that he's probably passed over and over and over again, and all of a sudden this ground is holy. Was it always holy, or was it just holy just right then? And you know what I realize when I read this? That it's the same exact principle that God is close to us. If we would just take enough time to realize that he's there. And sometimes I'm so busy doing other things that I go walk right past burning bushes all the time. Sometimes I'm doing things that I think are important, that I think are God things, that I think are, are good things to do. And there's a burning bush right there and God is waiting to meet me in that moment. Think of all the things that God would love to just pour into us if we would just maybe put our phones down long enough to, to see that burning bush. Just, just long enough to hear his voice to feel his presence. This isn't just in Genesis or Exodus. Even the psalmist says this in, in Psalm 139. He says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. And if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day for darkness is as light to you. Where can we go? So the psalmist is getting that here. The psalmist is, is realizing that there's no place I can go that your presence is not always there. The presence of God is everywhere. It's everywhere. The presence of God is transcendent and intimate. It is. God is always present. Acts uh, 17 uh, puts it this way. And Paul speaking, he says uh, it, in a kind of different vocabulary, he says, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps fill their way towards him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. God is closer than you think. He's closer than you think. The spirit 
of God is closer than you could even imagine at all. Tozer, in The Knowledge of the Holy, in chapter 14, talks about this idea of the omnipresence of God. And he talks about God being close, but still God being transcendent above all things. And he kind of holds those two things in tension. And he says, God dwells in his creation and is everywhere, indivisibly present in all his works. He is transcendent above all his works, even while he is imminent within them while he is close with them. He's above, as one writer says, and he is below. He is inside and he is outside, yet he cannot be contained. He is closer than we could ever, ever feel. It's funny, it's in church, like we use language all the time that I think is really, it's almost in conflict with with this, like, Have you ever been in church or just talking to people about church and be like, man, we were worshiping and then all of a sudden God showed up, right? He was already there. He was already there. Like I get what, I get what we're saying because there's times that we want God to just increase and we want to feel the manifest presence of God. Like I get that, but I think some of our Western culture has made this real, um, kind of dual idea about things that are spiritual and things that are physical. And we think of things only happening in certain places. And we think that God's presence isn't all places at all times and everywhere. And there is no such thing. If we said that to the psalmist, like, man, God just showed up. He'd say, what are you talking about? Or I don't know if you've ever prayed for somebody and just say, like, God, I just pray that you'd be with them. I think Paul would be like, what are you talking about? Like, he's always with them. He's within us. He's all around us. He's over us. He's under us. He's in us. He's outside us. And he can't be contained. He is everywhere. He's with us. I think, I think some of the biblical authors would just be a little stunned when we say, like, man, I'm just going to take Jesus to, you know, to my campus. And I'm going to, and sometimes I just want to shout, like, man, he's already there. He's already there. He is. And the idea is that we go and we partake and partner with what God is already doing. With what God is already doing. John 5 kind of shifts this a little bit and it says this. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, and so here Jesus is again in trouble with the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders um, because he often healed on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders uh, began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. So God's presence is everywhere, and God is always working. God is always working. God is always working. You might feel right now that that maybe you're sick, like we were talking about needing healing. God is working right now. You might feel, feel like God doesn't even know what your problem is. He's working. He's working. Even in the struggle, even in the places that you least expect, God is working. Even in the places that just are painful for your life. Even in the struggle, he's working, he's working. Know this tonight, all of us have certain places, places that we don't feel like are real spiritual places. And I just wanna say this, God wants to show up there. God does, God wants to reveal himself in that place and he wants us to become aware that he is already there and he is already working, amen? He is already there and he is already working. The places that you least expect, God is already there and he's already working. Maybe a marriage that you feel like is just, it's not what you thought it was gonna be. He's there and he's already working. Partner with him, partner with the presence of God that is already there and already working. Become aware and acknowledge the presence of God that is already there. Amen? 
Uh, I'm going to ask my dad to come up real quick because uh, I'm going to do a physical illustration. I need somebody. Uh, he's going to hold me. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no, go ahead and come up. Uh, wait, get, throw him a mic. He is going, something's happening tomorrow morning that I just wanted, he was telling me about this, that is exactly this. In a random place, God is doing something that nobody could have expected or nobody could have just years and years and years ago ever like come up with. Like I remember a few years ago when we first got city center, I was here working around Christmas time, getting ready for one of our services. And I was here on the stage and my phone rings and I pick up and my dad's like, hey, are you alone? And I said, uh, yeah, which I wasn't. But uh, so <laughs> then I, I walked over and I sat on the steps right over there and he told me, something amazing just happened. God just gave us the old Montgomery Wards building. And I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, that is amazing, this whole building. And God is doing something amazing through that building downtown. Tomorrow morning, something really cool is gonna happen. Can you just tell them what's going on yeah, with that? Yeah, tomorrow morning, um, uh, a bunch of us will be out there at five o'clock in the morning. You guys know that we were, you know, all of us, the team, Don, Carl, all the city serve team, the people that work here have been, working diligently against all kinds of odds for the past year and a half to, uh, to build the two towers, one of them that's going to serve emancipated foster youth in our community, and one of them that's going to be a, a, a place for people to live that are going through job training, coming out of the mission, come out of Teen Challenge, come out of programs where they need job training so that they don't have to keep going back through this vicious cycle of poverty and every demon in hell didn't want that thing to happen. I mean, if I have ever seen just the, the demonic, you know, hindrance on a project, and I've done a lot of projects and seen a lot of demons try to keep projects from going forward, this one took the cake. So I'm like, but tomorrow morning at five o'clock, we're pouring the cement pad, and over the next few weeks, those two towers are going up. Yeah. And so we give God the glory because God was there. Mm -hmm. He was right down there on F Street, right down there in the middle of all the brokenness and the mess The people drive by and they're like, this area is hopeless and people have given up on that part of our community. It's going to be a physical testimony of the miracle working power of God, not only in the lives of people, but in the community itself. It's gonna represent transformation. And so God Amen. is there. Amen. He's there. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's stand up. Would you just pray with me? Father, we just, uh, we love you. We love that you are, you're transcendent and above all things and you're omnipresent, but still God, you are as close as the very mention of your name. Your Holy Spirit is not only in this room, but dwells and lives and inhabits our very beings as the temple of the Holy Ghost. And we just, we acknowledge that. And Lord, we pray that we wouldn't ignore you as we walk through life, but that we would acknowledge the presence of the sacred and the holy in everything that we do and everything that we say. Help us to be aware of burning bushes that we're passing by every day. Help us to be aware even in those random mundane places, those certain places, God. Lord, we love you and uh, we just thank you for your presence. Would you just do that right now? God, we just thank you for your presence. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that surrounds us. We thank you for your, your comforter. We thank you for your direction. We thank you for the, the boldness to be a witness into your uh, gospel. We just thank you so much right now for your Holy Spirit. Would you inhabit us, God? In your name we pray. And all God's people say, amen.